Uh, so we're going to cover some of the major developments, and then we are going to go into the specific areas that Cavalry focuses on, so uh, medical, transportation, public infrastructure, and home. Um, and then we're going to talk about how you guys can get engaged in policy, should you so wish to be. So, um, in terms of major developments, this is the biggie, the gold standard major developments that we have seen in um, the, the past year that has had an impact on what I would call cyber safety. What we would all call cyber safety, perhaps. Um, so basically, the DMCA, who is familiar with the DMCA? Quick show of hands. Okay, so I don't probably need to tell most of you, but uh, in a nutshell, the US has two copyright laws, because one is just for losers. Um, so there's one that basically says copyright's a thing and we should respect copyright, we like copyright. And then there's the DMCA, which says, uh, so about that copyright thing, uh, yeah, we were serious about that. So if you circumvent technical protections that are put in place to protect copyright, that's, that's a problem for us. So not just the copyright issue, but also the circumventing technical protections. Um, what this means is that a lot of research has been uh, subject to the DMCA. Uh, because often research involves circumventing technical protections. Um, now, what the DMCA does, uh, it does, it does a couple of things. Firstly, it has some permanent carve-outs, some permanent exemptions uh, to address this problem, but they're very, very narrow. So one of them is um, about reversing the hardware, but it has very narrow restrictions. And one of them is about um, testing uh, Security of data in transit, encryption. Very narrow, very narrow boundaries. Um, so if you wanted to do things like look at firmware, traditionally that has been frowned upon. Um, when I say frowned upon, I mean with handcuffs. Um, so uh, the DMCA also has this secondary thing it does where it says, okay, uh, this is about technological controls and technology moves faster than law. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to say every three years we'll open a process where you can apply for an exemption and you apply to the Copyright Office and the Library of Congress because they know a lot about security research. Um, so, so that's what it says and the idea is you apply and then every three years any exemptions that exist, apart from the permanent ones that I just mentioned, roll back. So even if you already got some in, you, you, you lose them and you have to go through the process again. And they have this sort of multi-layered process where you apply and then there's a comment period where people can say, no, that sucks, I hate it. And then there's another comment period where people can say, no, I love it, it's great, we should do it. And then uh, there's some testifying that happens. Uh, testify. And then, <laughs> um, and then the Library of Congress and the Copyright Office look at all of this stuff and they go and they talk to other parts of the government and like Alan and they come back and they say, yes or no on your exemption. So why is this a major thing for us? Well, last year we went through this process and there are a whole bunch of people who participated in requesting exemptions for security research. There were four security research requests that went in. One for security research for medical devices, uh, one for security research for uh, cars, and two for, for general uh, consumer-oriented technology, consumer research. So the Copyright Office and the Library of Congress got all of these in together, they looked at all of them, they went, oh, these all kind of overlap, we should do something that encompasses all of them. And they went and they talked to NHTSA, who went, Ugh. and uh, And <laughs> they, they talked to the FDA, um, and they talked to the NTIA uh, at the Department of Commerce, who said, yes, security research is a thing, and it helps us support a free and open internet. We should support it. It's good, we like it. And so they said, oh, okay, oh, that, that's good, right, we like it, yes. Uh, these technology manufacturers, though, and their alliances, they seem less enthusiastic about the whole idea. They've written some letters. Uh, what should we do? And NHTSA went, uh. Um, and, uh, and the FDA and the NTIA gave much more balanced advice, and so eventually what happened was uh, the Library of Congress and the Copyright Office said, okay, we will have an exemption for security research, one exemption, and it will cover any consumer-oriented technology, 
uh, provided it's not in production, so no wandering around hospitals, unplugging shit and plugging in USBs. Um, sorry to spoil your fun. But because this is all a little bit like, ah, we're not really sure what to do, and it's just still going, ah, uh, we're going to delay it for a year. So you can, you can do this, it'll come into effect, but rather than it being immediate, we're going to delay it for a year. Except for voting machines, because there's kind of a thing coming up. <laughs> Um, so please, go test voting machines. Um, so anyway, uh, so the deadline for this, when it comes into effect, is October. So for the people who have traditionally not considered themselves technology providers, of which in the IoT space we deal with many, um, who, you know, they're now dealing with lots and lots and lots of lines of code, but don't think of themselves as technology providers, they think of themselves as car makers or medical device makers or whatever it is. For those people, they have this sort of looming deadline, and it has an impact. It has an impact, yeah, that we're seeing already in the actions of some of these companies that don't consider themselves technology providers, but increasingly are. Um, there are numerous examples of this. Um, one is the NTA process uh, the, on vulnerability disclosure. There have been many automakers and some medical device manufacturers that have participated in that process and have attributed their participation to kind of a better dialogue with their regulator because it demonstrates that they recognize this is an issue that they need to deal with and that they are engaging on it. In addition, GM in January of this year published a vulnerability disclosure policy in, co in coordination with HackerOne. Then in April, May, <laughs> Johnson & Johnson uh, published a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program as well. Uh, and then most recently in July, Fiat Chrysler America, FCA, published uh, a bug bounty program in coordination with Bug Crowd. Great, so we're starting to see like real developments and the alliances in this space are kind of pushing their members to kind of understand, hey, October's gonna happen. Researchers who have been too afraid to disclose in the past and have been storing up vulnerabilities are going to suddenly come out of the woodwork and they are going to disclose and you're going to have to have processes in place to deal with this. So we are seeing a huge cultural shift, which is actually awesome. I mean, this is like the best possible thing we could hope for. Bear in mind, though, we have two years and then this goes away and we start the process again. So the battle is certainly not done, done. Um, and because of this, because of this sort of strange process where you're applying to the Library of Congress, which looks like a very technological place. Um, <laughs> because you're applying to the Library of Congress and the Copyright Office and you're going through this sort of strangely um, intensive process and there's lots of uncertainty, um, and, and really this is about something that isn't a copyright issue. I mean, most researchers don't, as far as I understand, they're not really trying to um, defraud any company in terms of the copyright stuff. It's, it's really just like, hey, you have a vulnerability, let's fix it and not put people at risk. Um, so because it's not really a copyright issue at its core, there are people who are trying to get the DMCA changed at a sort of more basic level. And there are a number of different ways of approaching this. Uh, one is to work through sort of the more traditional routes of getting congressional support, trying to get legal reform. Um, the Copyright Office, for what it's worth, is actually quite supportive of all of that. Uh, in conversations that we've had with them, they've been like, yeah, yeah, we don't, really, we don't really know about this. We don't really think we should be making decisions on it. We're happy to support this. Um, another route to go is you could launch legal action against the Copyright Office, which is uh, what the EFF and um, some other people are doing. That was announced last week. Um, I don't want to get too much into it because I really like the EFF, but um, I think that our, my personal view on this is that our better path forward is through collaboration and finding common ground and building trust. I think that is a massive theme of I Am The Cavalry. Um, and if you don't want to build trust and find collaborative opportunities, this is possibly not the room for you, um, in all honesty. And so I kind of feel like, you know, when you sue people, you sort of undermine a lot of that. Um, and whilst I don't expect Alan to comment in any way, shape, or form, <laughs> I imagine that when, you know, when the research community decides to sue the Copyright Office, it does make the advocates that we have had feel a little sheepish in continuing to advocate for us. Um, so there you go. That's my personal view on it. I still love the EFF in support of the EFF, uh, but that's my personal view. 
So, development for medical. I've been talking a lot, so we're going to ask some other people to come and talk instead. Um, so first, we're going to welcome Suzanne Schwartz from the FDA, who's going to talk about some changes they have made, which is very cool. Uh, yeah, uh, here, have mine. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> there you go. All right. Yeah. So a, a lot of what Jen had provided in the introduction are um, areas and items that we feel uh, very, very much aligned with. And um, I'm going to take a step back, actually. So. How many of you have had any kind of interaction at all or n know much about the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration? Okay, so there's a fair amount of number of people here, okay. Um, and, and obviously we're the regulatory agency uh, responsible for different medical products. I come from the Center for Devices and Radiological Health and it's our center, our medical product center that oversees, that has oversight on both the pre-market as well as po post-market authority of medical devices that are distributed uh, within the United States. And the past few years has been a huge awakening for the FDA as well as for more broadly speaking, I would say the healthcare and medical device ecosystem in coming to terms with the challenges with respect to medical device vulnerabilities and the need to address those vulnerabilities. So if I were to go back a few years time, somewhere around the 2013 period, the spring of 2013, we experienced our own wake up call with regard to vulnerabilities that were brought to our attention and needing to really therefore engage with the industry, with the medical device industry in a manner that is somewhat different than we've had in the past. And what I mean by that is recognition that there's a need for raising awareness, educating, doing a lot of outreach on a topic that many of the medical device manufacturers, I'm not gonna say all, but many of the medical device manufacturers really did not have on their radar as being something that needs to be addressed uh, in, a, in a very proactive manner. The ecosystem for us is a complicated one because of the fact that it's not just medical device manufacturers, but are the end users, the healthcare delivery organizations, the hospitals, the clinical sites, the patients that utilize devices. And just because a device is regulated by the FDA doesn't mean that we have that kind of end-to-end -end oversight and authority over the device's use once it's deployed out there in the field within the hospital or within a home or with, you know, with a patient who um, has a device that's implanted. So when I think about what we were faced with at that time, it warranted the need for us to really embrace the idea of bringing the community the healthcare community together, together around, 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 around the, the, uh, the, the necessity, necessity to address, address the challenges, challenges with respect to medical devices. devices. And, there, and, and there's, there's a way to look at these down challenges and being very, very, you know, superficial, superficial here, here, but, here, but you've got the pre market, market side, side devices, devices that, that are in are their early, early design, design concept, concept phase, and, and, and development. development. And then you and have then you all have those devices, devices that are actually that are out there in the field on the post-market post -market side. side. The, the way, way that we have, have been addressing, addressing medical device security, security is by messaging and socializing the necessity for the total product life cycle approach to medical device security. So for new devices, new technologies that are emerging or that are in the process of being developed and designed, the need to be able to build in that security a priori from the, from the beginning, to bake it in, not to kind of have it as an afterthought to deal with security and then bolt it on afterwards. We know how challenging that is. And so um, in 
I guess it was back in 2013, 2014, we had released what's called guidance that provides to the medical device manufacturers what our expectations are for manufacturers to uh, address cybersecurity in the pre-market phase. But that's only a part of the story. I wouldn't even say that that's half the story. It's a fraction of the story. The bigger issue are all the devices that are out there in use in the post-market that many of them are what are called legacy devices or devices that were built um, at a time where, uh, again, security was not on the forefront of the manufacturers or on the healthcare delivery organization's mind. And these are devices that day in, day out, more and more vulnerabilities are being identified and are, are emerging and need to be assessed and uh, need to be dealt with. But we can't, we absolutely cannot do this alone. And so we went on this campaign of really uh, engaging all of the stakeholders within the ecosystem. And this was also very much in parallel with efforts by the administration through the issuance of executive orders and presidential policy directives that set a certain expectation or framework for what government regulatory agencies working with the private sector could be doing in order to improve or strengthen cybersecurity of critical infrastructure and healthcare public health medical devices are part of that infrastructure so we um, embarked on this journey uh, to understand all of the wants, all of the needs, all of the challenges of the stakeholders in our ecosystem. And in so doing, it become, becomes really, really critical to bring the security researcher community into the fold and to give the security researcher community not only a voice to be heard, to be listened to, to be paid attention to, but respect and a seat at the table and to recognize the value that, secure, that security researchers provide by way of expertise in working with the medical device companies and working with the government in understanding the vulnerabilities that are out there and how we need to be addressing them and uh, addressing them in an expedient manner, in particular when they present concerns for patient safety, which is ultimately what the FDA is concerned about and I think what we're all concerned about. So um, we, uh, through these efforts, came to uh, know I am the Cavalry, Bo Woods, and, and Josh Corman really, really well over the past couple of years. And this has turned into quite an extraordinary partnership by virtue of really learning from uh, the uh, security researcher community as ambassadors to us uh, for that and our being able to exchange information and present the perspective that the regulator has as well as what we know of the stakeholders in the community. And I would go so far as to credit this type of engagement, this close collaborating and partnering with I Am The Cavalry and with others, with me the medical device manufacturers, with the healthcare delivery organizations, but the, the level of engagement was so closely knit that uh, the guidance that we issued on post-market just a few months ago, back in January 2016, was considered to be a rather solid, a rather robust guidance um, and one that people across the entire ecosystem could kind of nod to and say, oh yeah, you know, this policy makes sense. Obviously there's tweaks that'll have to happen with the guidance as we finalize it. But what we did was we introduced concepts that are, we believe are really critical and that is coordinated disclosure, the importance of coordinated disclosure of researchers working together with manufacturers, working with also information sharing and analysis organizations as part of developing that transparency and having processes in place for handling vulnerability information as it comes in. So we built into the guidance you know, the fact that FDA recognized those standards and that we consider it really, really important as part of the management program, the overall comprehensive risk management program of medical device manufacturers to 
undertake uh, the, their assessment and their management of medical devices uh, from a cybersecurity perspective with these standards in mind. Now, I mean, I can go on for a very long time, but I think I've already taken a lot of time. So maybe we can get addressed a little bit more during whatever Q&A or if people. Yeah, and there's, um, I think, a medical session after this. Yes, so yes, yes, can yes. ask questions then. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, one thing that I uh, want to call out there that I think um, maybe people are modest and don't call out themselves is, um, you know, as Suzanne mentioned, when the FDA was working on this stuff, they um, they collaborated with members of the research community, which, you know, all props and all power to, um, to the FDA for doing that. That's a huge thing. Um, it actually is creating a new model, and um, I think that they deserve a round of applause. <laughs> which I can't do holding a microphone. Um, the other thing is that there are people in this room who also participated in that process and also influenced it. And, you know, I, <clears throat> from time to time, I have heard or seen people question what the cavalry is doing. To those people, that's what the cavalry is doing. And that's where the strength is. It's behind closed doors in, um, in non-showy, non-ostentatious conversations. But, you know, there are people in this room who had a real impact on that stuff. And I think that the FDA would acknowledge that they added value to the conversation. And I think that deserves to be acknowledged. So I'm going to ask you again to give a round of applause. But there's more. Um, so this was not everything on medical. Uh, there were some other things that happened on medical, and Josh is going to come up and talk about it. And if you don't know who Josh is, then there's no point in me introducing him. Hey, Josh! I, pro I promise not to yell. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think I'm supposed to hit the task force, yeah, um, the CISO bill. Okay. Um, so there's going to be more medical content throughout the two days. But for this chunk, uh, if you didn't see this morning, there's one more thing I want to embarrass Suzanne a little bit more about. Um, <laughs> we, uh, you know, we didn't get in a long bio for her. But when when I first uh, started getting in aware of this, it was people like Dr. Kevin Fu who had done some medical hacking. It was uh, Barnaby Jack before we lost him. It was uh, Jay Radcliffe. And, and people had been trying to do this, but they, they left very, very frustrated. In fact, they, they believed that the FDA type situation was intractable. Um, one of the doctors yelled at Jay at some point, not an FDA person, and saying, there's no dead bodies. This is academic and esoteric. And until there's proof of harm, you know, real dead bodies, we aren't going to do anything. And I kind of bought that initially. But um, meeting Suzanne, I mean, she's an amazing equivalent peer to the rebellious, you know, passion that we see in this community. Um, you know, the FDA government, I think Frank said this from NHTSA, government moves really slowly. But there are change agents uh, and people that are just like us who are looking for that teammate in us. So if we can be a teammate to them, they will be a teammate back. Um, so every time I talk to her, I get more impressed. But she was a trauma surgeon, burn unit specialist. I mean, every part of her fiber is about saving lives. And now we have a new way to do it together. And even though we believe that you would need dead bodies to see any significant change, last summer they issued a safety recall on the Hospira drug infusion pump with zero dead bodies, zero proof of harm. And they had the presence of mind and the courage to push in a pretty hard government circumstance to really see that an unmitigated pathway to harm is sufficient to trigger corrective action. We don't have to wait for calamity. And I think um, as much as I'm really proud of the people in this room that helped bring the security research perspective, none of it works if we don't have amazing teammates. So she's one of my heroes. And uh, I hope that uh, people get to know her better. Uh, really briefly, um, one of the things that's been a fruit of this is we've established this trust that Congress in the, the CISA Act of 2015, in December, uh, which most of you know is the information sharing bill, they had a provision in there asking HHS, Health and Human Services, to do a one-year task force on cybersecurity. Um, there were 20 people to be picked. Um, and I think because of the work we had done, um, they wanted the researcher community to be one of those 20 voices. Um, so Michael McNeil, who was up here earlier from Philips, he's one of the largest device manufacturers on the task force. 
Um, I was asked to represent um, the research community. So people who have worked in healthcare delivery are doing research on this. If there's anything you want pulled into that process, we have a 12 month um, assignment with six things we owe to Congress, HHS, and the White House at the end of it. And we're about halfway through. And some of the stuff we're gonna cover tomorrow with the cameras off <laughs> are the really, really, really hard problems that we are really, really, really concerned about. So I think a critical linchpin in making hospitals safe is making the devices more rugged, more resilient, more defensible. And I think Suzanne's part of the universe has been very helpful in raising the bar on individual medical devices. In addition to that, this task force is now looking at how do you make healthcare delivery organizations that still use Windows XP in really old gear and don't have CISOs and are wide open and naked to the internet in, all, in many cases. We, her work is very necessary but insufficient for this other stuff. So um, one of the policy advances I think we should be very pleased to see is A, that they have a focus on cybersecurity, um, B, it's an open process, and C, that one of the 20 voices is basically us. So if you weren't aware of that, please load me up. We're looking for people who have pen tested HDOs, who have clever or innovative ideas. We're looking for academics who can find more realistic ways to prevent attacks. And I think the real big wake up call for them was the Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital losing its ability to, to provide patient care. And the ransomware is just, it's like shooting fish in a barrel for the ho hospitals. They just are not in a good position at all. So if you missed this morning's stuff, we're gonna dive into that a little bit more tomorrow. And the second thing's a little less related, but it's, a, it's another good sign. Um, I guess, just like in the private sector, sometimes a CISO reports to the CIO, and there's a little bit of inherent conflict of interest. Um, HHS, um, there was a bill introduced uh, to basically give more power to the CISO by stripping it out from underneath the CIO. I don't think there was necessarily a structural problem, but they said, you know what? Um, the operations and the cybersecurity of a government agency is important, so they invited me to be a, um, I guess I get to my first congressional testimony, I still didn't do as well as Jen did for her, her toys, but. Um, <laughs> Jen avoided swearing. <laughs> but I, but yeah. I did say on the congressional record that I'd be most talk about blowing up buildings. Yes. Um, so it's an intimidating process and it's, it's a lot of work, but, um, but here's the, the, good, the good news, bad news is, um, this is gonna happen more often. So now that we're starting to build trust relationships with some of these key uh, congressional committees, they don't all get hearings, but several times, almost like once a month at least, um, there's an emergent topic where their members want to get smart on something. So I have to find like the world expert on crypto that can actually talk to a congressperson like now. So you might get a phone call from me or uh, from Bo or something where we're not necessarily looking for the best crypto person, we're looking for the best translator. And um, as they recognize how dependent they are on cyber, we're gonna need to build those muscles. And we're not always gonna do it right, and we're not always gonna use the right words that this community likes, but um, I think it's a good sign that we've had a few now, like Dave Kennedy, yourself, m me. We're, we're starting to establish ourselves that whenever there's a cyber topic, they at least might ask us our opinion. So we might not be on camera, on C-SPAN, but we are at least being asked for information, I think that's also a very good sign. Is that what you wanted? Sure. Okay. So yeah, so there's lots happening in medical and I think, sorry, I can't remember how microphones work at some point. Um, so there's lots happening in medical and I think you know the key takeaway here is we are seeing progress, which is kind of awesome. Um, so on to transport um, and self-driving cars. Um, Thanks, I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot going on in transport as well. Um, and not just in terms of cars, although cars obviously make a lot of headlines on a regular basis, um, and there are a lot of things happening there. So um, I'm gonna talk about some car stuff, and then Amanda's gonna talk about some aviation stuff. Um, so there are a few things that have happened. Uh, so one, has anybody heard of the Michigan car bill? All right, a few. Um, so uh, Michigan introduced a, um, a proposal for a state bill, uh, and it would have made it um, an offense to, uh, to access the, the computer systems in a car without permission from the manufacturer, which, again, kind of makes research pretty illegal. Um, so this was introduced by the Senate majority in, uh, I'm gonna try and get my timing right on this, April. 
um, end of April. And then like very, very quickly, there was, a, there was a response from the community. So a bunch of, a coalition of um, researchers and uh, people from the security community responded in private in a letter and said, hey, um, super concerning, you're, you're basically making research illegal and kind of pointed to the fact that there have been some instances of published car research that's been very valuable and that you know we, we're thinking about lives here and got a really great level of engagement from, um, from the bill sponsors. So they came back and they said, okay, this sounds serious, we should consider it, we should talk, let's chat. And there's been some back and forth and um, the proposed changes that they're looking at making would make it that the car's owner can give, it can give permission to somebody to access the systems. Um, and they're defining owner to include um, like a, 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 what's the right word for this, lessee? Yeah. Is that the right word? Um, yeah, so, so it's much broader now and it would mean that I can give access to you to do work on it as a researcher. Um, they are uh, reconvening, I think tomorrow is when the, the state legislature, legislature comes back and we don't know when the bill will be reintroduced um, but we do expect that it will be introduced with updated language. So again, yay for researchers uh, collaborating and kind of moving this forward. Um, then there was a couple of things that happened on a federal level. Um, and one of them was a, and I can never remember the name of this, I always refer to it as the NHTSA bill, which is not what it is. Um, no, the other one. Yeah, the National Highway, whatever it was. Um, so this was proposed uh, the beginning of the year. Um, and again, it had something in it that said it would be a federal uh, offense to uh, access the computer systems in the car without the permission of the manufacturer. Again, there was a strong response from the community. Uh, this actually did have a hearing. And, um, and so there was uh, the, the Commerce Committee uh, had a hearing and they, they called in um, NHTSA and some other people, uh, various auto alliance type people, and they kind of went through it and there were some questions that were asked in the committee hearing about researchers and what the impact would be. And generally speaking, like the feeling is the bill is not going to move and if it does move, then the language around this particular piece will be changed and adapted. Um, and so, Again, it looks like we're making the right kind of progress because there is a high level of engagement. Um, so at the moment, I mean, like, I think you guys are probably all aware that nothing much is likely to move in Congress this year. Um, there's kind of some other stuff going on. So nothing's moving anytime soon, but the question is, like, when we're thinking about movement, we're thinking about what's going to happen next year, what will be reintroduced, what might have legs. And so the engagement that we're looking at driving is really about how do we improve things so that when they get picked up next year, they'll be less damaging, um, and so it looks like we're going in the right direction with that stuff. So then the third one is, as Josh mentioned, the Spy Car Act. Um, this is Senator Markey's bill. It was uh, not this year, it was last year, and I think it was in the early part of last year, so this is old. Um, and uh, Spy Car stands for um, Security and Privacy in Your Car, or For Your Car Act, and it is looking at sort of measures that automotive manufacturers can introduce to um, advance security or improve privacy um, in, in automobiles. It, again, super unlikely to move. There are some good things in it and some questionable things. And that is generally the case with legislation and legislative proposals. So it's about engaging and educating. Um, if you are interested in looking at this, you should take a look and then reach out to um, Senator Markey's office. Uh, but they have been talking a lot to people in the community. They've been talking to the automotive manufacturers. Um, and as I said, like some of the stuff that they're proposing is actually pretty cool and it would be very interesting to see what happens with it. Um, but then there's also things like there's a, a pen testing requirement that seems a little like it may not be very practical. Um, they want to do uh, the, car, the stickers that say how secure you are. I don't know how that would work in practice, but I kind of like the idea of it because then I think it gets consumers into a point of view of thinking about security and having an expectation of security information, which we don't have today. And anything that improves security awareness, I am a fan of. Uh, but it's really unlikely to move anytime soon. 
So that's, that's pretty much what's happening in car land. Um, that's the main stuff. And again, like, there are people in this room who have heavily participated in moving all three of those bills on in terms of the language, if not, like, the bill's actually moving. Um, so again, if you're one of those people, you should give yourself a big pat on the back uh, because that's awesome work. I'll just highlight a couple of developments in the aviation industry. The major development was this year, very recent, in the last few weeks actually, but I'll start um, in September 2014, which is when the Aviation Information Sharing and Analysis Center, or ISAC, was established. And it's just an indication that aviation companies are aware of this issue, are, are recognizing there's a need to share information and, and to get a better handle on the cybersecurity threat. And then in 2015, I'm sure, as you're all aware, there are lots of um, things that happened to increase awareness of the threat of, of cybersecurity in, in the aviation space. So there was the, um, the instance of Chris in the United tweet. There was um, an instance of a Polish airliner being brought down. Uh, there was the in, uh, what happened in the Malaysia airline crash. And then there was also something called a, a Government Accountability Office report, GAO report, which highlighted that the, the Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA, did not have sufficient security in, in place to protect uh, airline traffic control systems. So in the kind of fall of 2015, there was a lot of interest uh, among politicians of dealing with and addressing this issue. And then this past spring, the, the Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA, Reauthorization Act um, was introduced in April. And what the, the Reauthorization Act basically does is it extends the mandate and the funding for the FAA. And it was just finalized uh, mid-July and, and signed in mid-July. It extends the mandate and the funding for the FAA for another 14 months. Then we'll revisit all these issues. But the really important thing that happened um, was that there a part of the, the reauthorization bill required that the FAA uh, take a look at, at <coughs> reducing cyber, secure, or cyber risks um, to aviation systems, civ civil aviation systems, and gave the, the FAA just 240 days to come back and report um, on a, a framework, policies, principles of how they were going to help reduce risk and a couple of the things that, that were specifically called out was thinking about reducing risks on in-flight entertainment systems and to the air traffic control systems. And then the same time that the that FAA reauthorization bill was introduced in April of this year, there was a, a bill introduced, the Cyber Air Act, um, by Ed Markey, Ed Markey, uh, 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 from Massachusetts, the senator from Massachusetts, and it was purposefully timed at the same time as the FAA reauthorization act and contained some of the same ideas that you know, there needs to be some sort of cybersecurity guidelines for aviation, um, that there should be mandatory reporting of certain kinds of incidents to the government, um, and that there needs to be serious thought and uh, for the infotainment systems uh, for how to secure those. So that, that bill uh, is kind of been set aside. It's in committee, which means it's being considered. It could um, eventually make it to the floor, it could not, but uh, that has been presented to help move the conversation forward. Thanks, Mano. Um, I actually think you're next. Yes. Nope. Uh, what? Yeah, so, uh, but if I, I'll do the, the, the White House grand bill. Um, okay, so there's, there's been a, a few things, again, in, in infrastructure. Um, I'm sort of mindful of time. Um, there is a bill that was introduced by uh, Senators Graham and White House. It was originally called the International Cybercrime Prevention Act, and it was introduced last summer. Um, and then it was uh, abbreviated down and proposed as an amendment for CISA, which did not move ahead. Um, and then it got reintroduced this year as the Botnet Prevention Act. And they're still working on it. There's likely to be a new version next year. And it basically does a bunch of different things uh, around law enforcement, authorities for computer crimes. Um, and one of the things that it does is it looks to update um, some of the existing laws, including increasing the penalties for computer crimes against critical infrastructure. Um, that's pretty much what it does in relation to critical infrastructure. 
it's, it's that. And it's not more complicated than that. You guys should check it out. But it's likely to be reintroduced next year in some other format. Again, it's called the, Prevent the Botnet Prevention Act, if you want to check it out. You can just talk about the NIST framework. OK. You guys are all familiar with the NIST cybersecurity framework? Yes? <laughs> <laughs> Just a very quick update on, on that. Um, as I'm sure you're all very aware, there have been numerous RFIs be before the framework was finalized and since the framework has been finalized. The most recent one was in December of 2015, last year. Um, and that RFI was basically asking, again, about how organizations are using the framework, but also more forward thinking, you know, how should the framework be revised? Um, should NIST continue to have the role that it's had or should the framework move to another place. Um, and so, as a, a, and the results of that RFI response and, a, and a, a workshop that NIST hosted in April, they are updating the framework. And so, they are working through the pieces uh, that they, the feedback that they received on things that need to be updated or added. Like, there have been, uh, there's been some attention around the sub cyber supply chain risk management being added. Um, so uh, updates or changes to the implementation tiers. Jen Ellis wrote that they needed to think about having vulnerability disclosure best practices. So <laughs> yes. uh, and so that's going to be happening through the fall. And, and it, the plan right now is that they'll release uh, a draft update early next year for comment. I think, I think that the next one is Alan. He's going to talk a little bit about uh, home stuff. Thank you, and uh, I know we've sung a lot of praises about the Calvary. I will just say that um, Washington, for better or worse, often depends on uh, outside experts, uh, special interest as they're known, and often they get a bad rap, but really, you know, the, the expertise comes from people in industry, it comes from civil society, and Washington has dedicated people who care about privacy, who care about encryption, there are lots of civil society people who really help us understand the core values. There hasn't been people who really say cyber safety is a social value that we all need to work for. And, and the Calvary has been a really incredible resource for those of us in government who, want to ha who need the information in order to work and build programs. So I'm from the Department of Commerce. Uh, we like it when markets work, when people get to buy and build and innovate. Uh, maybe in slightly different orders, depending on your priority of where you are in the department. Um, we're not a regulator, uh, but we're interested in promoting uh, better markets for security. So just today, we announced a new initiative on IoT security, uh, starting with the premise that it's very hard for consumers to know what to look for in security. You can't really go to a smart TV and say, gosh, did they use a B-SIM secure development lifecycle process when they built my smart TV? Um, but there are some things we can start. We can say, does this device support security upgradability? Can this device be patched? The problem is, there isn't really a universal definition of what it means to be patchable in smart devices. It's a multi-dimensional problem. And so we are launching a multi-stakeholder process to bring together security experts, uh, device manufacturers, device integrators, those who are responsible for connectivity of devices and saying, let's talk about the many dimensions that we care about for patchability, whether it's the user experience or whether it's authentication of the devices or whether it's how long this device is going to be patched. And let's build a taxonomy and then from that develop a much smaller set of definitions that consumers can know about, to look at, to work with, to say, consumer reports says I should look for these words on the label. And that manufacturers now have some specific goals to work towards, to actually demonstrate to their board or to their cost counters, oh, we can get a return on security investment by making these products better. Uh, this is voluntary. We're not saying everyone needs to have this. And by making it voluntary, we believe that we can get active participation from industry, bring them to the table for those who want to be active participants. Most people in industry really like security, at least on the security teams. Right? They wouldn't be in security if they didn't care about it. So it is going to be a, uh, we're launching it now. If you're interested, please uh, engage. There's a blog post out. Uh, and the first meeting will be in uh, sometime this fall. The other thing I want to flag is by my colleagues at NIST, the National Cybersecurity, for, the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, 
uh, is engaged in a number of initiatives basically helping organizations transition from a technical standard into implementation. Standards are fantastic, but often organizations don't know how to go from a highly technical standard to actually adopt it. And so NCCOE does things, they build reference implementations to say, okay, I need these different components. I need something that is this standard, something that is this standard, and here's how they fit together to actually be secure as opposed to just one particular piece of technology which won't do the job. They have a particular initiative right now on the smart home focusing on authentication and authorization. How do the different pieces of your connected home actually manage authentication and authorization? They call them non-personal entities. So, you know, you have different parts of your smart home. We need to have common standards for authentication and authorization to make sure you can actually have a secure home uh, so that, you know, different pieces of devices of your smart home can't attack other parts of your smart home. Uh, so if you're interested in that, I'm happy to connect you to the right people. Uh, but again, I just want to thank all of you and urge you to get engaged. Uh, this is something where we really need as many people who are passionate about security to weigh in uh, because there are lots of voices in Washington for, you know, build more widgets or my industry is more important than every other industry. Uh, we need more voices for security is something that really affects everyone. So thank you. Thanks, Alan. And just to add to what Alan said very briefly, um, the last uh, multi-stakeholder project that NTIA ran, um, which was on vulnerability disclosure and handling, one of the criticisms that came from the community is that there are not enough researchers participating. So um, I really hope that you guys will take the opportunity to participate, even if it's not sort of in person at the meetings, get on the phone, listen in. Um, your voice can only be heard if you lend it. Um, Okay, so we're gonna, whoa, we're running out of battery. That's good, because we need to move through. Um, okay, so how do you get engaged? Um, the big hint here is not like this. Uh, <laughs> nobody likes a flaming torch, except the British when they're burning down the White House. Um, so don't do that. That, that would be the first thing. Um, the, the main thing is really uh, to talk to people who are already involved in some way, find out how you can get involved through them. Um, most people will try and help you get started in a way that doesn't blow shit up. Look for common opportunities. There are opportunities through forums like the NTA process, which are looking to have organizations, individuals participate in an open sort of voluntary process. There are also required comment opportunities as part of the implementation of legislative law and by an administrative, by an agency that's administrative law, so they are required to have open comment periods on their rulemaking. And so there's an opportunity to influence how an agency uh, implements a statute. So for the next one, um, the bill that I referred to is the NHTSA bill, even though that's not what it's called at all, and I, can, I wish I could remember what it was called and stop mentioning NHTSA um, because I feel bad now. Um, that bill was a great example of uh, people identifying, hey, this is going to be the Commerce Committee. So let's reach out to staffers who are on the Commerce Committee and tell them what we're worried about. And that led to questions. So if there's a hearing that gets announced, you can um, look at the committee members and reach out to their offices, and you can basically send them suggestions for questions for hearing. And they'll go through them all. The key to this is they need them at least 48 hours before the hearing. That gives them a chance to go through them, and then they have to submit the questions typically 24 hours before the hearing. So that's the only thing. It's like you have to get your timing, timing, but like identifying people in the committee and reaching out to them the topic you care about is a really good way Getting involved in a helpful way. Similarly, identify your local representatives and write to them. This sounds a little bit like a democratic party. Thank you. 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 Thank
Um, but you know, there's, there's an example. Uh, I know some people who are really engaged in, in pushing the Electrify Africa app that passed earlier this year. And they, they had made a concerted effort so to, <laughs> to, to write letters to call their, their local representatives. And they got their local representatives to sign on to the bill. So it, it happens. You have to be coordinated. You have to actually do it. Um, you might get a form letter back, but. <laughs> I, I would say there are two keys to this. Uh, one is you either need to hit them on a topic they already care about in yep. some way. Um, so it needs to be your rep and a topic they're already interested in. So I'm in Massachusetts, so the fact that Marky is already looking at a lot of the stuff is helpful for me. Um, the second option is you need to have other people who care about it too. A coalition letter will always have more impact. And a coalition of businesses based in the area will have even more impact. Um, so that's, that's basically the gist on how you approach that. Um, and then the last thing is the FF has a great action center. It's all described on their website. They give you ideas of how to get involved. You should check that out. Um, we are racing against my battery right now. Uh, OK, so in terms of communication and outreach, again, not burning torches and pitchforks, not super helpful. The biggest thing for staffers is they want an ask. The first thing they'll say to you when you sit down with them is, what can we do for you? Um, and apparently when you say, blow up the CFAA, that's not a good answer. But <laughs> uh, do have a clear idea when you go in of what your goal is, and have a clear idea of how you're going to speak to that. Like, what is the story you're going to tell that helps them understand it? The first time I went to DC, I went and I was like, it's terrible. Security researchers are being oppressed. We must do something. And I realized that. Effectively, I, the day I went was the day that healthcare.gov fell over, and Obama went on TV and went, yeah, I didn't know it wasn't working. And so all of the Dems we met with were watching the news going, holy shit. And all of the reps we met with were watching the TV, rubbing their hands with glee and laughing maniacally. And it was a really great learning, because the key here is they're super busy. By the way, the next time I went was uh, the big immigration thing with the kids, uh, the border, and then the, second, the next time was Ebola. So big lesson for me here is like these people are busy. They have a lot of stuff going on. And the first several times I went to talk, I realized that what I was basically saying to them is, hey, we need to build a, a rocket ship and fly to the moon. And they were going, what's the moon? And so you need to make it really easy for them. And that is not being dismissive, right? Like They're experts in policy. They know shit that I will never know. That is their job. It is not their job to be experts in security research. It is not their experts to be their job to be experts in any of the stuff we deal with. That is our job. And so our job is to make it easy for them to understand. And if you can create that quid pro quo, they will meet you halfway. So think about what your story is before you go in. Be really clear on how to make it simple for them. Make it simple for yourself and for them. Well, part of building your story is doing your research, of course. And and by that we mean, you know, talking to, to others with like that are representing different pieces of the puzzle that you're trying to build and bring uh, and bring to them. So you know, from my perspective, that means I'll often go talk to the engineers. For years, it might mean that you need to sit down with someone who has done this policy stuff before and get a sense of how you would go about having an ask that's gonna, going to actually be relevant for the individual that you're sitting down and talking about with it. Yeah, so, it with. so the next one, this is not a call for you guys to be suck-ups or to be obsequious or to say anything that isn't true. Like You shouldn't be inauthentic or disingenuous. However, if you see people do something that is genuinely good, recognize it. If the FDA comes out with post-market guidance, that's a really good thing. Tell them that. That is awesome. Be encouraging because other people are much more likely to want to emulate it if they see it get a positive response. We're really good in this community at pointing out the things that are broken, and we're terrible at pointing out the things that are not. So that, that is a, a big one to do. Related providing actual actionable feedback is you know, acknowledging that even if you totally disagree with every single thing um, in a bill or something, rec try to recognize where that it's coming from and that it's trying to achieve something that from the perspective of the person writing it is a good thing. And then really figure out how to help that person understand, you know, from your perspective, why that path is not the way to get to the end that is good. And then provide very actual feedback for how, you know, just saying that's, that's not good, that's not right, is not enough. You need to be constructive and show them how to get to where they're trying to go. 
And we are right at the hour, so uh, rather than going through the, the, the following bullets, I think we covered avoid jargon and, and, and the, the experts courteous, yeah. thing. The <laughs> thing I will say is we shouldn't need to, I told you we were in a race against our battery, and you missed the Archer slide. God damn it! Uh, um, so the thing I will tell you is um, we shouldn't need to tell you to be courteous and helpful. That should be a basic human thing. Um, and frankly, if you don't know that, I can't help you. Um, so good luck with it all. Uh, do we have time just for 10 minutes of questions? Or we're sure. super at the hour, yeah, so. Do, uh